Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Thank you for joining us. Uh, once again, I have this wonderful privilege to join you to hear a story. But this is a story we've heard before. Our guest tonight uh, is a returning guest. It's been 13 years. Uh, our guest is Dr. Petrock Willie, a former evangelical. Uh, the last time we had uh, Petrock on the program, we were filming in England. But now he's uh, over here on this side of the pond. So first, uh, Petrock, welcome back to the program. Oh, thanks for having me, Marcus. Thank You're you. over here in the States now uh, as a theolo theology professor? I am. I'm now living in Steubenville. I absolutely love it, uh, where I'm a professor of catechetics. Yes, so the Lord has all his surprises, and uh, here I am over on the stage side. And you, uh, it's good to have you over here. I mean, I don't want to say that, but you've pretty much been involved with catechetics since coming into the church. I have really. It was a surprise to me that uh, the Lord gave me that kind of tasking, and I've loved every moment of it. Um, certainly for my first um, seven years as a Catholic, I was in Oxford. Uh, okay. But even then, I was in a Christian college teaching. Uh, okay. And then I moved into catechetics from 1992, which was the date of the publication of the catechism. Right. Been there ever since, and I've, I say, really loved that. All right. Uh, well, if you came in and started teaching catechetics when the catechism started, then then how did you let the catechism be so ignored by so many people? <laughs> we'll get to that later, maybe. Yeah. But let's, uh, you've already been on the program, so uh, if the audience would love to hear your full story, they can go to that old Journey Home program. Although I can't remember if it was a full hour or half an hour. We did some short programs in England, but regardless. Returning guests, I invite yeah. you to give yeah. us a summary of your journey. Okay, so yes, I was, well, I was raised an evangelical. Um, I was, as I reflect back on it, I'm just so grateful for my, for my upbringing, really. And it's, there's a phrase from uh, Dostoevsky that I always remember, and that is, if you give a child beautiful memories, you can hold that, that child can be held hmm. for the rest of their lives, because they can always return to those, and I have beautiful Christian hmm. memories. Hmm. Uh, so my father was actually originally um, a lay Methodist preacher uh, from Cornwall, which is right down in the west of England. I was actually raised in the south then, in the south of England, and um, by the time I came along, obviously he was no longer in Cornwall, and we just looked for the best evangelical church, which I think a lot of people did, really. So we, we went to a Baptist church. There was church. no particular loyalty to the church you were a part no, of? No, it was more to Christ and whatever he wanted. Where's the best community? Really, where is there a good Bible community? Um, we were very fortunate in the pastor we had in Canterbury. And so for the next 14, 15 years, that's where I would have gone to church. Um, my parents both very, very committed Christians. In fact, I mean, interestingly, all of my family, apart from one, have since become Catholic. But each of them in their own, on their own journey from that evangelical, original evangelical um, commitment, uh, but really following wherever they thought the Lord wanted to take them. Um, so, yes, it, w it was a beautiful upbringing I had. I'm going to pause you there yeah. then. So the, there you are, an evangelical, mm -hmm. not necessarily a Methodist or a Baptist, but whatever you, the Lord's leading mm -hmm. you, in Canterbury. Mm -hmm. As an evangelical Englishman, mm -hmm. what did you think about the uh, St. Augustine, the, the uh, you know, Canterbury Cathedral, its history and all of that? Uh, I'm, I'm sure you're aware of it, obviously, when you were there, but what do you think of it? Yes, <clears throat> I suppose as a child, you don't necessarily think of these things. They're the bones you, you live around, as it were. They're the buildings and the great structures. Um, you live with the culture you're in without necessarily identifying uh, what you have around you. And I don't think I was particularly aware of of Anglicanism, for example, as a separate phenomenon. That was a group of Christians, as far as I was okay. concerned. Mm -hmm. I would go to the cathedral. I would enjoy uh, participating occasionally in a sung vespers. Uh, but this was all as an evangelical, without really any sense of there being alternative Christian commitments for me. Or, or even the Catholic roots that were there. No, Catholics, um, I think that they're is quite a strong sense in England, or there was when I was growing up, that if you were Catholic, you were not really English. 
Mm. So there was still a, a strong sense of Catholics as probably an immigrant population, okay. uh, possibly Italian or Irish or Polish, but, they're, but, but not English. And I think that is part of the great, if you like, the narrative that, of the Reformation, which English people have been left with, mm. that the golden age of England is, is uh, the age of the Reformation, is the Elizabethan mm. age. Um, and that's very, very strongly communicated in schools, um, so just in general culture and education. And so I didn't really question that. Okay. Yeah. Um, so there you are, you're evangelical. Evangelical, um, content, growing up, happy childhood uh, in a small village near Canterbury. <laughs> Sounds uh, wonderful. Be yes, beautiful setting. Uh, actually living on what's called the Old Pilgrim's Way, which was the way, if you read Chaucer, the pilgrims used to walk into Canterbury. So we were actually on that road. Wow. That was a, a lovely place to live. And um, I suppose like a lot of teenagers, I, I simply became slightly bored, not knowing where my faith was going. <laughs> uh, and I can trace a kind of an initial reconversion uh, to the faith, simply one evening sitting down and reading Luke's Gospel and suddenly being struck by um, almost the absurdity of believing in a God who, who ended so tragically, apparently, if you leave out the, Reformation, uh, the oh, resurrection right. for the moment, uh, who just uh, concluded his life with everybody leaving him, he's, he's a failure, his followers have run away, uh, he's been abandoned, and apparently the whole thing has ended in a disaster. And I think as a as a teenager, that struck me as a very challenging kind of religion, and I suddenly saw the faith I'd simply grown up with in a different light, uh, as something for which I could really give my life in, in a much more personal way, but I knew I needed to make my own commitment. Did I believe this or not? Uh, mm -hmm. So I can remember that evening really vividly. One of the very nice things about my family life was um, parents being around a lot and just being able to talk talk to them and uh, I can remember speaking to my mother there was a little perch I'd have by the side of the kitchen we'd often have kitchen talks and uh, just really saying I, I really felt the Lord was calling me now to hmm. to to a deeper kind of commitment uh, and wonder what to do about it and about, fun about what age was this about? so this would have been about 15 or 16 okay. all right yeah and um, interestingly then I've just spoken about, in a way, how I was just an evangelical. Uh, I simply, at that point, thought, well, let's just go and speak to somebody about this more locally. Mm. And I went, went to speak to the local Anglican pastor about it and found my way almost accidentally just beginning to attend the local village Anglican church, <laughs> which just shows you kind of the fluidity, in a way, of, yeah. of a lot of that sense of, of, of which church you attend. Especially of evangelicalism, it's it's about Jesus Christ, it's a commitment yeah. to Jesus Christ. Maybe yeah. not that important to where you go, but we also know that within Anglicanism, there's a wide range of churches: high church, low church. Yeah, sure. Where, where did you find yourself? So this would have been, I would say, middle church, probably. Okay. Um, again, it was so there was a, a communion service once a week, but by and large, it was based on. Um, Bible study, uh, fellowship, uh, but it was, in a, it was in the local village setting. And that, that began to really appeal to me because it was also a kind of, how does the faith find expression in a culture? You know, I was beginning to realize the importance, you mentioned the cathedral, yeah. just of, okay, this was a thousand year old church. I was going to, and you know, just suddenly getting a sense of I'm English, this is my history, this is the faith, actually it does belong here and I belong here. And, and uh, I think that was a bit of a bonus for me. And coming to love, just walking down to the local church, the midnight mass, uh, the sense of belonging to the local community as well. It's, well, here we are. So that was when you were in your late teens, um, it was about 90 years ago, right? No, I'm joking. <laughs> but it, my point Thank is... Thank you, Marcus. <laughs> just pulling you a little bit. But, but the point is, you were seeing this Anglicanism as, in this, as your English. This is your culture. Mm. Things have changed a lot mm. in just the years since then. 
I'm wondering if that would be the same sense that a person would have now in 2016 sure. with the changes with all the other faiths coming in and immigrants. Things have changed a huge amount. Um, the phrase the Catholic Church uses is new evangelization. Uh, so in England now there are more people who would identify themselves as what's called nuns. In other words, no particular belief. Uh, for the first time outnumbering Christians. And in a way that, that's been a kind of a gradual move. Right. Uh, that, that need that really that um, the Lord's calling us to a new mission. Uh, and we need to find out how to do that. But in many ways, it's in your but, lifetime that this has had such a drastic change. Yeah, it's during my lifetime. Probably the seed, well, the seeds have been sown decades, right. decades. Um, once one begins to examine what happened to the history of Christianity in the West, you, you can see it's, it's been a long time coming. And the abandonment of the faith in so many ways that may not have seemed important at the time. But even in my time, there would have been a neglect of what I call doctrine, in, um, not in the evangelical churches, but as I was to discover in the Anglican church, and a replacement of doctrine with, with a kind of, some kind of generic Christian values. Mm. And thinking, if you like, that a moral code could hold people rather than the person of Christ. Mm. So, you know, that, that in the end, I suppose neglecting the fact people want the Lord they don't, want, they don't want a moral code. Um, and that it doesn't last long to hold Christianity as a morality once the dogmatic faith has gone. But all of that I was to discover later on right. and gradually as I began to, to look at Anglicanism and the shape of Christianity and see what had happened to it. At the time I was very glad, I think village Anglicanism is, is still, it's not strong but it's still existing. Um, it still has an attraction for people as a kind of a community bonding, holding on to some kind of tradition. Hmm. Uh, and that was certainly the case when I was growing up there. Again, yeah. There's a strong connection between being English and being Anglican. And s that was still a very strong sense, I think, yeah. Certainly to be Catholic, it would have been almost unthinkable for an English person like myself. A village, uh, living in a village and becoming Catholic would mean you were ceasing to belong to the village. You probably knew few English Anglicans that had become Catholic. I don't think I knew any. Okay. No, I don't think I knew any. And Newman wasn't somebody on your radar? Newman was not on my radar at all. Okay, all right. No. So, all right. Our guest is Dr. Petrock Willie, who's a uh, professor of theology at Franciscan University. Um, so there you are, you're becoming even stronger English, if you would, from yeah. your commitment to the Anglican Church. Yes, even stronger. And um, I felt that I wanted some way of expressing that. And at the time, I um, saw that as a call possibly to the Anglican priesthood. Mm. So I went to a university in London, um, very much hoping to pursue a theology degree and at the end find some kind of outlet in ministry. And I suppose that's where I first came up against a very, very strongly articulate liberal Anglicanism, uh, which surprised me. And uh, I was very uncomfortable of, about that because of my evangelical convictions. But I hadn't realized, I suppose, the way in which Anglicanism was such a broad church and that the heartland of Anglicanism had already moved to a kind of liberal consensus. Mm. And I'd been on some kind of strange wing of it, you know, out in the country. So there were very, and there were quite a few of us who were at university who did feel alienated by that and wondered what to do about the situation. Um, certainly at that point, I hadn't thought I would find my way into the Catholic Church. Um, I'd been reading Kierkegaard and I, I had my own intellectual tradition I'd been, been sort of strengthening myself in. But it made me fairly intolerant as a young person can be towards what I was seeing mm. in the, at the university. So we would go along often to the university Eucharist and we would watch the professors and see which bits of the creed they weren't willing to say. We'd be guessing, you know, we would identify um, which people belong to the myth of God incarnate school, which was very strong at the time. Mm. In other words, the, the lack of faith in the, the divinity of Christ. Um, there was even a group called the Sea of Faith, which was a group explicitly uh, committed to atheistic, sporting atheistic clergymen, 
which was, which was again, <laughs> strong at the university at, my t at the time. Uh, they were called the Sea of Faith group, based on a poem by Matthew Arnold called On Dover Beach, talking about how it's as though the tide on faith is growing, going out. But somehow believing that the Anglican faith could survive the loss of an objective God. Mm. So you can see how far it had gone. Wow. And it was kind of inevitable for me that my university years should be really searching years because of that. Um, I, I would have known within a year that I couldn't go into the Anglican ministry, that somehow that would not be the place. I toyed with Buddhism for a while mm. because I just wanted to find, you know, was it some kind of spiritual path I was supposed to be on? You know, what, what was happening in my life? But more and more I knew that um, it's like the title of your program, The Journey Home. In a way, home is always ahead of you. You know, you, you, there is always a call. The Lord's always calling you on. So where was I to go? And I think then I began to sense that I couldn't see in my evangelical tradition the spiritual paths that might be open. And I think this might have been what first began to, to move me a bit. So a kind of crisis about liberalism and authority on the one hand, you know, what was happening to dogmatic faith and belief. And on the other hand, looking for the resources where I, I'd hoped to find them about how to pursue a deepening relationship with Christ, how to move on in my faith. Mm. And it was then that I, I began to read, without knowing they were Catholic, but Catholic authors, and in particular, writers from the spiritual tradi tradition a lot more. Um, and I began to discover uh, monasticism. Uh, and you mentioned Augustine, I began to discover the Benedictine tradition and uh, in a way realised that there were 2,000 years of a spiritual paths which had been set out before us, which we can follow yeah. to deepen that walk with the Lord, which I hadn't been so fully aware of. I mean, it's kind of fascinating looking at it from this side of the pond that you were, it was all around you your whole life. I mean, um, Walsingham's right up the road, and, mm. and like you said, the, the Pilgrim's Way that you lived on, sure. and all that. But another thing I wanted to mention, again, pause as you go along, for uh, viewers who's, who bemoan <clears throat> the fact that their children were brought up evangelicals or faithfully in the church and then had been drawn away. I mean, when you're in a stream, as you were in, a stream of theology at that school, mm -hmm with people with all these other views around you, mm -hmm. seemingly fine folk. Yeah. They can be charismatic in, in, in their personalities and winsome and sincere. And you're, you're on the stream of figuring out what is their journey mm -hmm. taking you. You can be drawn to be open to all those other voices. That, sure. I mean, I'm thinking about some of the writers. That was the time of J.T. Robinson, maybe when he was over there sure. uh, writing. The Honest to God debate, yeah. Yes, which was again that what you're mentioning, which was about, if you like, the loss of belief in an objective God or of a personal God and replacing it really with a philosophical concept. Yeah, yeah really. Um, and you can see in a way how at a certain age you, you are, I mean, you're definitely exploring because you know that um, in order to be true to yourself, you know, this whole kind of call to authenticity, which is very, very strong in, in young people, especially moving into a university education, you're trying to see which ideas really uh, are going to make sense of your life uh, and to which you can give yourself. Now we know, coming, looking back and coming out the other side, we know that the Lord is always bigger than those ideas. And yeah. he's always, he's going to use everything, every bit of the search to, to, to lead you to himself. Uh, and he wants nothing else, you know, everything that looks like maybe a displacing of you can be used by him. He only allows that because he can use it. Um, at the time, it can feel chaotic. Mm. Uh, and certainly it was a disorientating time for me, even though quite an exciting one. So I knew I was on a new path, um, a new path. I didn't think it was leading me to Roman Catholicism. Yeah. Um, I mentioned I was attracted by Buddhism, and I think this was in a sense, it was just, if you like, the lure of the new, uh, the lure of something esoteric. But quite quickly, I realized I could be such an eccentric person. And in a way, the one way God needed to save me was to keep me normal. So I knew I must stay, 
I must stay mainstream in one sense. I just didn't know the mainstream of Christianity was was the 2,000-year tradition. I didn't know where mainstream was. Um, but I knew God was trying to save me from just being eccentrically myself. Um, so, um, yes, I began to read spiritual authors, uh, especially monastic authors. John Cross uh, and Teresa of Avila. Yes, some of those, some of those Carmelites, but above all, I think Benedictines. Mm. I, I read a lot of Thomas Merton. Um, and in fact, in 1980 or 81, I think, I actually flew over to Kentucky and visited um, a monastery called Gethsemane, Gethsemane where, he, right. where he lived most of his life. I actually wanted to see what the, the context of his own faith journey had been. Um, and after I left university, I went on retreat to try and work out what to do. And it was a very, very small lay Christian community. Um, it happened to be Catholic, though that's not why I went there. Mm. And I lived with that community eventually for three years. It was in the middle of Wales. Um, they ran a retreat house. And during that time, I was very happily still an evangelical living in that retreat uh, house, but I came to more and more love the ordinary day-to-day uh, -day spiritual life of, well, saying, we say, saying the divine office, which is really just reading the Bible in a structured way uh, several times a day, uh, coming to love being in the rhythms of prayer, which were part of that tradition. Uh, and gradually, I suppose, in a way, the Lord sort of gradually converting me and, as I say, moving me into this kind of mainstream of the church's spirituality uh, and making me comfortable in it and showing me how I could deepen my, my walk with him, how there was a way forward um, and that the Holy Spirit had been guiding the church and her tradition for all of this time and building these, these traditions of prayer and of faith in Christ. So... By the time I left that community three years later, I knew I wanted to become a Catholic because mm. it had ceased to be something about just about belief or authority. And it was now about following um, this deepening path with Christ and knowing there was a way because I knew I needed ongoing conversion in my life. Uh, the evangelical tradition is particularly strong and making sure you have an initial commitment to Christ. Mm -hmm. um, I found less there that would help me renew that commitment every day beyond a certain point and I was very grateful for those paths mm. of ongoing spirituality that allowed me to express an ongoing conversion. So that's where I found myself. Well as an evangelical you can uh, float from Baptist to the Methodist to middle of the road Anglican mm -hmm. and, and do that. You can find a deeper relationship in ecumenical Catholicism, charismatic Catholicism. What was the mandate though to break through the big tradition that you had been fighting against that no one becomes Catholic? What, what was the mandate? Why, why become Catholic? I mean, you can still float and, sure. and visit. Sure. Um, you can see in a way in which grace works because, in fact, when I was, I mean, it's, it's an amusing story about how I was received into the church, a few things about that. Uh, first of all, it was very hard to persuade um, Catholic priests to take seriously the desire of somebody to be received into the church. Uh, and I remember going to two or three priests who just said, come back in six months if you still feel the same way and you're fine as an Anglican and not, not thinking there was anything yeah. very much in, in what I was looking for. Uh, so it was the age in a way where the Catholic Church itself was going through some kind of nervousness about was it, did it really have the truth of, it was the, the Church of Christ where, as it were, which subsisted there in yeah. its fullness. Um, but you can see in a way the strength of that conviction because I was not put off at all. I was determined in a way that it was like banging on the door that I would be received in. And eventually in Canterbury, um, a priest reluctantly agreed to receive me into the church and the local mass center was in a mental hospital. And he said, we'll receive you. Um, I asked for the feast of St. Petrock 
which was which the name I took for confirmation. <laughs> um, and he received me in the chapel of the local mental hospital. So it was a most bizarre experience as I made my act of faith that all around me there were people shouting and screaming and walking <laughs> out. And, and uh, <clears throat> it was as though, um, so somehow I found myself, it was like that moment where I read Luke's gospel. You know, it's, you, it's a, it may seem absurd, but you're gonna make this act of faith. And I knew I, this is where the Lord was bringing me. Um, and as you say, the mandate was, I think, although it was to do with intellectual coherence, which, I mean, obviously the Catholic faith is just so, it is so coherent. It makes so much sense. It just, everything holds together. Um, and in a way, I, I knew that and I wanted that, but I wanted something else. I wanted the Lord himself, who I knew was there. I mean, I suppose looking back, I'd sat at the back of Catholic churches without knowing why and sensed the presence. And you can look back on your life, can't you, and see all these things. Yeah. Uh, it was to do with the presence of Christ in the church for me, even though I wouldn't have been able to articulate it as strongly as I can now and say he, he's really present in the church. He's present in the Eucharist. He's present sacramentally in his priests. He's there at the sacraments of reconciliation. All those things I can say now was still, in a way, not fully, uh, fully formed in my mind. But I did know the Lord was there, and the Lord was calling me down that path, um, and that I had to make that move. And it was a bereavement. Hmm. So I know how strong it was because I knew, if you like, that reception in the mental hospital, in a way, kind of symbolized something else. I was now leaving normal community. And I did think I'm ceasing to be English at this point. So I still had that strong sense this was not really part of what an, an ordinary English journey would be like. Um, so you can see how strong the kind of the Anglicanism, the feel that that is the norm for a, certainly a certain group of English people would have been. Yeah, I'm wondering if that's, you know, is stronger for uh, English converts than American converts, though we have a history here of the same idea that uh, that the papal church is a foreign church. It was true in early America, mm -hmm. very strongly into the, the 19th century. Still, of course, here in the in the backdrop of people's conscience in America, but I'm wondering even stronger in in England. Yes, I mean I think it was. Uh, it is strong, probably still. Um, since then, there've been, there's been a lot of um, additional research into the history of Elizabethan England and of the, the Reformation by people like Eamon Duffy, mm -hmm. the stripping of the altars, a study really of, if you like, the slow boiling of the frog, that it, it really wasn't uh, an immediate removal of Catholicism from people's faith. In a way, there was an attempt to lull people into a sense that it was more or less the same faith, that we just gradually are replacing things. Um, and really trying to keep that whole sense of normality about the faith. And also at the same time, a writing of English history which made Eliz the Elizabethan period the golden age. I mean, I think now looking back upon the conversion of England, it's really important, and a lot of people are saying this, that one identifies where before the Elizabethan period we have to begin to look. All right, well, let's pause there, Petrock, and we'll come back in a little bit. See you in a bit. We're going to come back with the rest of Petrock's story after the break. Welcome back to Journey Home. I'm your guest, your host, Marcus Grodi. And our guest is Dr. Petrock Willey, former evangelical professor of theology at Franciscan University. I've got a couple questions on theology, but before we get to that, um, a couple names of theologians that mm -hmm. on this side of the pond were very influential to many evangelicals like C.S. Lewis, but also mm -hmm. J.I. Packer yeah. was very important, John White. These were yes. evangelical Anglican writers that were yes. important in England. Uh, 
were they influential to you in your journey? So people like Packer and White, I would have come to know about while I was at university, but they were not well respected there. Um, mm. And I don't think I would have, I mean, I knew of Packer's work, but didn't really read much of it. Lewis would have been, again, not particular. It's interesting how well known Lewis is over here. Yeah. I mean, obviously he is in England as well. Um, though I suspect his apologetics writings are even better known here. But uh, the Inklings and so on, because I, I lived and worked in Oxford for a number of years. I mean, I loved the Oxford group, you know, Charles Williams, Dorothy Sayers, mm. C.S. Lewis, yeah, yeah. Tolkien and so on. And uh, yes, so you've got the, the Eagle and Child, the pub where they, they used to meet and read their works to each other, where you can go and just see see those photos of them. Where but they sat. weren't as influential in England as they are over here. It's not that they're not influential and well known but I think in a way uh, one of the things about the states is there is a much more invigorated interest in a lot of the Catholic intra intellectual tradition and the Christian intellectual tradition than you find in England. Okay. I mean partly England struggles just because it is a venerable old tradition um, as many European countries do. Um, and in a way, the, if you like, the political and cultural elites have long since decided they're not so interested in, in Christianity and its roots. Um, so we know that at the turn of the last millennium, the European Union formally disavowed the Christian roots of Europe mm. and denied them. So um, now that's not to say that all the European countries, everybody who lives in them, doesn't recognize those Christian roots, but the, the main political structures uh, are not just ignoring them, they're quite deliberately denying them. Mm. So the European political movements have taken a different turn. Um, England, I mean, it's been called the center of the culture of death. I mean, it's very, very strongly committed to some of the worst excesses of um, anti-family, anti-life policy. Uh, mm -hmm. unfortunately, of embryo experimentation, of all of these things. It kind of leads the way to some extent. Um, it's not just that the faith has been gradually neglected, it's that there is a deliberate move to, to remove Christianity from these cultures, uh, which is why um, Pope Bendix set up you know, the Council for the New Evangelization, why Pope John Paul called for a new evangelization of Europe, because um, not just Europe, obviously, but the, the countries of the Middle East, the places where the, the Christian faith has grown and developed, mm -hmm. and where we can look back and say that's what a Christian culture looks like at its best. Mm -hmm. Those places where we have those historical moments, we have to preserve them. And to some extent in the States, there is, because a lot of the States, obviously we come from Europe, there is a love for those moments. Um, because they do represent a genuine past of the countries from which people have come. And so, yes, a love for Lewis and, and Christian thinkers like that is very strong here. University was a, had a big influence over here. Yeah, of course, yeah. Again, I, yeah. again that's an English uh, child, but, yes. it, but it had a big influence here in evangelicalism. Sure. I know that it did in, in, when I was a pastor. Yes. There's a personality trait uh, where we keep our faith to ourselves, you know, don't talk politics, don't talk religion, you know, mm -hmm. if you want to have a nice relationship with somebody, but especially keep our faith to ourselves. And it, it, that seems to me a particularly strong amongst British. And I'm wondering, historically, does that go back to Elizabethan times? Is there a historical foundation to the idea that your convictions have to be kept private? That, that is, uh, that's a really interesting question. Where has that come from? You know, the, that English reticence about religion and politics, uh, that keeping oneself, one's deepest beliefs to oneself and not sharing them. Certainly it doesn't help in the work of evangelization. Uh, but there is thought to be something almost improper. And I wonder as well whether it is, it's partly just an ancient culture hmm. where things are understood rather than more formally expressed. 
uh, so that as things begin to take on habitual expressions, so you don't need to say them, everybody understands. And so I think to some extent the whole, the freshness of being in the States by comparison, where people will engage you mm -hmm. in a discussion almost immediately about religion and politics. Um, in the gardens around the houses where I'm living, you know, there'll be, there'll be crosses with, you know, Jesus is risen all, all around up on the hilltops. You know, now this may not be entirely typical, but it's, it's a much more expressive culture still. Um, and that's partly, I think, because it is a culture that is putting down its roots still. It's still doing that um, even after two, three hundred years. It's, it's, and we know there's a bit of a culture war going on here about what, how do we express it and make sure those roots are put down. But they were put down a long time ago in England. And so it can take longer to see that you need to express them and be articulate. So I think to some extent, you know, the English are just slower to speak because they don't realize the need uh, because of that. It could be partly fear. Because there was well, persecution of the Catholic Church, certainly. I mean, there was a time there where no matter what you were, you had to be careful. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it led yeah. to the English Civil War in the mid-17th century. You know, that whole idea, whether you're high church or low church, I mean, yes. it divided England. And, yes. Uh, yes. Had a king's head cut off because, yes. because of those convictions. And I uh, wondered whether that was a foundation to that. Yes. Um, <clears throat> Your emphasis on catechetics, uh, I want to make sure we talk about that because was that as a result of your own journey that you found you drawn into the need of that or was also just seeing the reality of the church in England? So um, it was a kind of a tasking that uh, I happened to um, move into a job in catechetics at the, the year the catechism was published in 1992. And so my tasking was to work with this wonderful expression of the, of the Christian faith. Um, but catechetics uh, was, was very natural to me because it comes from a word just meaning, if you like, the oral handing on. So that's so evangelical. Um, so literally meaning echo. So if you're echoing, there's a voice you're listening to and uh, you're just trying to be faithful to the voice. and. Uh, so catechetics is listening to the voice of Christ and trying to make sure that that's handed on in an appropriate way, in a way people can receive. So it's being attentive to the listener as well, uh, and what can be received and what can't. But above all, it's, um, you can't be in the work of catechetics without making your own adherence to Christ the foundation. As soon as that begins to slip at all, you, you're lost, okay. because what are you doing? Everything uh, else crumbles. Everything goes. So, um, no, so that, in a way, it was, it was a beautiful thing to, be, to have that kind of work in life, to be paid for what I, I wanted to do most. Um, <clears throat> Why would you say we have come to such a situation in, in America and England where so few people are catechized well? Um, so, there are, there's, first of all, there's the whole world view. In, in a way, this, this idea about um, sleeping through the change, I think, is a big thing. If you're, if you're reading a book and you imagine, there's, there's the Bible, but we can take any book, and we just opened it at a page, um, and we read a few words. It might be one of Dickens' books, and you've got, you know, Martin Chuzzlewit said. What he said can only be understood in terms of the chapter and what's happening to him terms of his narrative. Mm. So you can only really understand anything in terms of the whole book. Uh, ultimately, that little phrase won't make sense. Mm. And more and more what's been happening in the West is that the worldview that supports the Catholic faith, the Christian faith, um, has been being dismantled. And I spoke earlier about the way in which we've been thinking we could do without doctrine, which is really just the basic teachings about what's true. Mm and still hold on to a kind of a moral framework. It's not only not satisfying for people, it doesn't make sense. I mean, in the end, it, we, we need to go all the way down the road to relativism and nihilism, which is where we've gone. Because there, there will be nothing without, without God and without the big picture. Mm. Uh, but what we call the whole movement of postmodernism is the, the loss of faith that there is a big picture. In other words, you just open the book and you read a phrase and it doesn't really make any sense. 
Now, I think what's happened to a lot of people is that we've been trying to raise people in the Christian faith, uh, and we've families have been trying to do a good job of that, but all around them, the education system in which they are, mm. the media culture, or the rest of the culture is telling a completely different story or not reinforcing it. And so we're just reading phrases which, okay, the children as they grow up know these mean a lot to their parents, but nowhere do they get that whole story, that whole narrative, that sense of convictions. And so if you like, catechesis is so important because it is telling of the, the, if the creed is a big story, right? It begins with God, the Father creating, it ends with the, with the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. So we've got the two bookends of the whole of, of the faith. And that's, in a way, catechesis keeps alive the big story. Um, certainly John Paul, um, I always think almost his most important work was the work he wrote on philosophy called uh, Fides et Ratio, Faith and Reason. Mm. And he said you have prerequisites before the Word of God can be preached. So there are certain things that must be in place. And the, the first one he called the overarching sapiential dimension. In other words, kind of understanding that there is a plan. Sapiential, mm. just the idea of wisdom. There mm. is a wise, ordered creation. There is a creator who has a plan. I think when people lose that, they lose a sense of comfort. You've, you're bound to lose a sense of confidence. Does this phrase now mean anything at all? So we probably need to look back to the philosophical roots as well, which have now gone into our culture very deeply. And I think um, it only has as much power as we give it. Now, that's, that's not a full answer, but the cultural elites who give there is no story, there is no big picture, there is no meaning, and who wants, in a way, who have given up hope and faith and who need, desperately need Christ themselves, those voices only have as much power as we're, we're willing to invest in them. And I think that uh, why catechesis is so important in the church today is because we have, we have to articulate the voice, make sure the voice of Christ is heard for people. A lot of people are more comfortable keeping it inward, as we talked mm -hmm. about, uh, they may be not accustomed to taking that bold step to talk about it. So there's that foundational problem. Mm. But there's also with the, with the voices around us that are caught up in these philosophical ideas mm. that many of us don't understand, or why would somebody believe that or do this? So how do you address the gospel to this culture? It, mm. it, it becomes more and more difficult. Mm. So we need a new evangelization. Sure. You and I both come from an evangelical background where we could easily say four or five spiritual laws and there's the gospel. Mm. You know, God loves us all, then there was sin that separated us, and there's a chasm between us, and Christ died for us, and if sure. we accept him, we're saved. Yeah. There's the gospel. Yeah. How do you tell the world the Catholic gospel? Mm. Well, I think that the, um, the way you don't do it is to pretend that it's something less than it is. Uh, I was, I've been very helped. My father was a pickle salesman. His problem was he had uh, the most expensive pickles. Uh, and in a way, they're more difficult to sell because of that. And he always used to teach me that you have to be ruthlessly honest with everybody you sell to. You have to believe in your product, be completely honest. Um, and he said, in a way, what works best is what he called the negative sell. The negative sell is, is really telling people they probably won't want what you're about to say to them. And uh, <laughs> so he would, he would bring his pickles and uh, then say, um, now you may not want these because they are, these are the most expensive pickles on the market. Obviously if you want the best, you know. Not many people do, but if you do want, if like the, the pickle of a great price, uh, then, <laughs> then I've got them. And, uh, he, people would relax because he was not trying to sell it. Um, the gospel is not a message which we're, we're doing ourselves a favor with. He, he knew in a way, because he really did believe in it, he was only doing a favor to the people he was selling it to. He genuinely believed that. So you really believe it, but you don't try and sell it. It is what's the good for them. So um, that um, conviction and yet allowing the truth just to be the truth is what I learned from him. And it was, it was a great lesson, really. 
But you can see that in Apostle Paul, he yeah. could have made the gospel easier if he'd taken the cross out of it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's right. But it's sold with the cross. Somehow people wanted it. That's how it's sold. And I noticed when um, uh, Pope Benedict published the UCAT, there's a little introduction yeah. to the UCAT. And he says to the young people, he says, young people, this catechism will not make your life easy for you. In fact, you will have to give your life for it. And it's what, what sold it. Uh, so we know Christ said it's the pearl of great price for which you give everything. We know Christ, in a way, his whole life, he gave everything for us. It's by what well, John Paul said, another phrase, wasn't it? Put out into the deep. <laughs> That's where you catch people. And I think we, well, we'll always catch people because it's the truth. They can't be caught if they don't hear it. Um, but one of the convictions of the church is the human heart is made for the message. Um, and as long as we, we know that's true and we can, we can give a testimony ourselves to it and give that with conviction. We've got an email. Let's take this. Petrock comes from Gabe from Nevada. The term the new evangelization seems to be tossed around as a catchphrase a lot these days, especially within specific Catholic circles. Can you reflect on how the call for a new evangelization has impacted your desire to spread the good news of Christ and his church, and along with some effective means to bring about this new evangelization? Okay. The new evangelization then, it's, it's a phrase, it, it's, it has a very specific meaning. Uh, it means to, it's if you like, it, it's quite an insulting meaning. Uh, it means that we and the, the Christian community itself needs to be evangelized. Well, we've kind of, we have know we, we need ongoing conversion. We've always thought that it's somebody else who needs to really hear the gospel, and we have it. And new evangelization is the call to us to make sure that we ourselves have heard the gospel um, and to be really equipped for mission. So the new evangelization is addressed to the Christian faithful themselves. Um, what's interesting about this, and I love the work of the new evangelization, it's what's different about it is that people, there's already been an evangelization. It's like going to somebody who's been evangelized, <coughs> excuse me, who's been evangelized and has now, I mean, evangelicals would say they're backsliders. We, we're cultural backsliders. We've let go of something immensely valuable. It's, it's been hidden, it's been thought to be of no use, but did we ever really have it? Um, so what's really wonderful about new evangelization, it's like going through the door, which is Christ, and discovering you had that treasure already in your house. It's got all the joy of coming home and all the excitement of discovery. So new evangelization is the most wonderful thing because you're helping people discover what they've got. Now, the challenge for us with new evangelization is that when people think they've heard it, they think that they've already had that, so they want something new. And you're trying to help people to discover what they've, in a way, never really had. They've never really been exposed to the gospel in the way that we know that that is, that is deep and meaningful for us. Um, and so it relies a lot upon personal testimony. There is... Um, the church says that the catechist is the soul of catechesis. There is no way other than by individual mentorship, than by individual testimony, ultimately, it's not a program you can give people because every person has got to go through the journey of discovering the truth that they already had. It's a bit like T.S. Eliot said, uh, the end of our exploring will be to come back to where we were for, and know it for the first time. As I say, it's a beautiful journey. It's the discovering that you had that gift in your culture and so on. And in part, it's helping people identify within their history where they can see the faith truly enculturated, truly incarnated, and come to love those moments. So alongside our witness, we need to identify those great historical periods and moments where we can say, look at that, that's what a Christian culture looks like. That's what, that's what we, that, and people will want that back um, as soon as they see it. If we take a phrase that a great many of our audience recite every Sunday, mm -hmm. or maybe not every Sunday, but if they were reciting the Apostles' Creed, if they said, in, 
and I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. Now, there's a phrase that we've said uh, maybe a, a hundred times. I'm, I'm sure in my life I've said a hundred thousand times because I recited it every Sunday when I was a, a childhood Lutheran. Mm -hmm. But what does it mean that I believe in Jesus, that he's the Christ, that he's, our, he's the Son of God, that he's Lord. I mean, there's a lot in there. Definitely. And so we can say it. Yes. We can say I believe it. Yes. But can I explain it? Yeah. Does it make a difference how I live? How do I tell my children yes. or my atheist neighbor? Yes. So catechetics is unpackaging that. It is. Something that you assume you've always known, but maybe I really don't know that. Sure. And I think it's in moments of crisis you learn it most. Mm -hmm. So in a way, although we, we're going into this culture war, we're, we're living in this state where in a way the faith might seem to be on the back foot. It's actually the moment of most discovery as well. Um, it's a bit like if you're trying to plant an oak tree, you plant it in winter to get the roots deep. This is where you really do learn to get it strong. Mm. Um, so we know at the end of John's Gospel, my Lord and my God, that highest acclamation was exactly the phrase which um, the loyal Roman had to give to the emperor. Mm. So it's at that moment where you have to make a decision, is Christ the Lord, that you know there's an alternative being offered you. And, our, and our, our culture is being offered alternatives at the moment. And because of that, the light of Christ can shine more clearly, I think. And people can be willing to hear. So what is it that's different about Christ and the gospel and what the church has to offer today? Precisely because yeah. of the conflict and the alternatives around. And it seems to me that the catechesis on the necessity of the church is even more and more difficult to communicate because we live in a culture not only where the majority of our non-Catholic Christian brothers and sisters, though have a commitment to Christ, not necessarily a commitment to a church, mm -hmm. but also we have a lot of Catholics that don't think we believe that anymore. Mm -hmm. So how do you communicate the necessity of the church today? Again, I mean, I'm going back to my father and the, the, the pickles, only because I think this is a really difficult one. Um, I was helped by a phrase by Thomas Aquinas. He, sa he said, when you meet somebody who finds, you know they're going to find this difficult, he said, say this to them, I'd like you to entertain a thought. In other words, I don't want you to commit to it. I don't want you to think you're having to buy into it, but I want you to allow this some space in your mind, just to allow it to live there and see what you think of it. And we do live in such an individualistic culture and this is almost my the biggest move, I think, for me as an evangelical was, in a way, a conversion to the church. Oh. I know the church is not the be-all and end-all, but it's the bit that was missing. Um, I never saw before that Paul's conversion was not a conversion in a way, because he said Lord. He, he already knew uh, this, that Christ was Lord in a way. He spoke to him like that. But the idea it was, why are you persecuting me in persecuting the Christians? Paul's conversion was to a love for the church, was to a love for the brethren. And that was the big conversion of his life. And I know that for me, not thinking of the Lord wanting to bring me along a path on my own and just save me, uh, has been the biggest thing in my life, that he wants, he wants to save a community. Um, I think it's a phrase in the Psalms, remember me, Lord, out of the love you have for your people. So that God remembers you because he loves his people and he loves me as a member of his people is a new, is a new take for me. Yeah. And I think probably, I mean, I spoke about my love for the office. In the morning, if I wanted to do my spiritual exercises, what do I do? I take the Bible out and I read it. E these evangelical roots go strongly. I mean... And I'm not saying that's wrong at all, but the, the, the church has an office where she structured the Bible for, you know, she's given you the Psalms in certain order and you just say them. My instinct is still to take the Bible myself and just read it, you see? Now I'm not saying, but it shows me I'm still, I'm still on an ongoing conversion to yeah. thinking, do you know that Christ has formed a community with a body, with a structure, it's a communion of saints, uh, it has a tradition, you're part of that. I love you as a member of the people I've saved. I love you as a member of the bride of Christ. I'm a member of the body. 
Uh, and all those things suddenly begin to take on a new light, Paul's image of the body, um, that he's saving you as a member of the New Jerusalem. It's all about a city, isn't it? Yeah. We're saved as a city, not as a group of individuals. If he wanted to save me on my own, he could have done. But he saved me as a member of the church. Petrock, thank you for joining us again on the journey home. It's good to have you over here on this side of the pond and at Franciscan University. And uh, I'm sure that the audience can go to the Franciscan University website to find out more about what you're doing there in the catechetics department at Franciscan. So thank, thank you. you very much. Thanks. And thank you for joining us again on this episode of The Journey Home. I hope that Petrock's uh, revisiting of his journey is an encouragement to you. God bless you. See you again next week. Thank you.